This is Father Bob Warren of the Franciscan Friars of the Atonement. Thank you for listening to this rebroadcast of the Ave Maria Hour radio show. The Friars' popular Ave Maria Hour was first brought to the radio airwaves in 1939, recorded in New York City and on the mountainside grounds at Graymore, a home in Garrison, New York. These timeless classic stories of the Bible and the lives of the saints came to life each week through dramatic reenactment by professional actors and actresses. You know, friends, Christ once said, do not hide your treasure under a bushel. In saying this, he meant share your gifts, share your talents. The Friars of the Atonement feel the message in these broadcasts remains as powerful and timely as when they were originally aired, and we are so happy to be able to share them with you today. To learn more about the missions and ministries of the Friars of the Atonement, I invite you to visit our website, www.atonementfriars.org. In the meantime, sit back and enjoy this rebroadcast of the Ave Maria Hour. St. Lawrence. To the catacombs. Forward, march. Even as the steady drum of marching feet beat on the streets of Rome, a band of Christians meets in the cavernous catacombs. They have been called by their leader, Pope Sixtus, who but a few hours before was told of a new decree placed before the Roman Senate by Emperor Valerian. The aged pontiff sits in his chair, addressing the assembly. And though the Senate vote was in secret, we may be sure that this last decree of Valerian's will be the supreme test of our faith. What can be done? We can die. I've called you here so that you may be prepared. Have no fear. Think rather of immortality than of death. Someone's coming. Stand fast. Well spoken, Sixtus. Stand fast. It's the prefect, Galba. Galba. The catacombs are blocked off by my troops. You'll be butchered if you try to escape. What do you want of us, Prefect? I have a decree just passed by the Senate on orders of the Emperor. Shall I read it? We can assume its contents. Nevertheless, I'll read it for the benefit of the dumb sheep huddled here. Now, Senators are a wordy lot. I'll spare you the preamble, the whereases and therefores, and get to the heart of the matter, which is death, hereby decreed for bishops, priests, and deacons. If... If we must die, Galba, know that it's God's will, not the emperor's. The result is the same. That would be true if death were the end of life. I'm not here to discuss a paradox, but to arrest you in obedience to the emperor's decree. Sixtus, you are a bishop. I am bishop of Rome, pope of the Catholic Church. The others beside you? My deacons. My friends, permit me to introduce you to your executioner. Prefect Galba, at my right, you see Januarius, Vincent, and Magnus. At my left is Lawrence. May I ask the prefect to be executed with his holiness? Request denied. We will execute you when it suits our purpose. Come, Sixtus, we're wasting time. Farewell, my children. May God be with you. I am ready. Father... Where are you going without your son? Take me with you. I don't leave you, my son. You shall follow me by a more glorious triumph. When will this be? You have three days on earth. Spend them well, my son. Pope Sixtus and several of the deacons 
were beheaded immediately after their arrest. Lawrence, aroused to great excitement by the prediction of Sixtus, began at once to prepare for his coming death and to spend his last hours in a way that would please God. He hastened to the altar and began to gather the sacred vessels. Who's there? Stephen, it's I, Lawrence. Lawrence? What are you doing with the sacred vessels? Stephen, you and I have but a few hours to live. Everything must be turned into money and distributed to the poor. But surely not the chalices for the sacrament. Everything. Nothing must be held out. This would be the way the Holy Father would want it. But even so... You were not there when the Holy Father was arrested. He spoke to me and said I should spend my time well before I joined him. I have heard. Then what better way to live than to give what there is to the poor? But I... Yes, yes. Even to this vessel from which so many have drunk of Christ's blood. It's sacred. It's silver. Precious because it will feed a starving man. Christ quenched his thirst from a vinegar-soaked sponge. What can I do to help? Search for anything that has value and convert it to money. Bring the coins to the Tiber Bridge and we'll distribute them to the poor. I'll have them gathered there. And be careful. The guards are looking for you. Halt! Come here. What have you in that bag? Alms for the poor. You're a Christian? Yes. Are you a deacon? Yes. Your name? Stephen. Come with me. Did this Stephen talk before he was executed? Ah, the same words as always. They welcome death because they believe in the words of a man on a cross. But he said nothing about where he got the money. No. Useless to threaten them with death. They welcome it as if it were a bride. These Christians are scattering money right and left to the beggars. Galba, you must find where they hide that money. I've searched every corner in Rome. Not all the officials have been executed? All but one. A deacon named Lawrence. Find him and bring him here. Perhaps we can persuade him to tell us where the church has hidden its treasures. Senator, here is Deacon Lawrence. Oh, sit down. No need to be frightened. Thank you. Uh, you Christians often complain we uh, treat you harshly. Now, I've not brought you here for torture. I merely want to inquire about something that uh, concerns you. I shall answer to the best of my ability. Uh, good. Now, I'm told you priests make offerings in golden platters that what you call the sacred blood is served from a silver goblet. And at your night ceremonies, the wax tapers are fixed in golden candlesticks. It's true, we make use of precious metals. But these things are not mandatory to the administration of the sacraments. Bring out these hidden treasures. The emperor needs money for the maintenance of his forces. The church didn't acquire its wealth for conquest, but for the salvation of all mankind. Lawrence. Isn't it a doctrine of your belief that you must render to Caesar the things that belong to him? Christ spoke thus when asked if he should render tribute to Caesar. Your God brought no money with him into this world. No. Nor caused it to be coined. What are you driving at, Galba? You'll see, Senator. Answer the question, Lawrence. No. He came to this world with nothing and left it with a promise. He brought only words. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And the word was God. So, it's Caesar who has his head on the coins and gives them value. Yes, yes, Galba, I see. Lawrence, uh, give us, therefore, the money and you can be rich in words. The church is indeed rich. Just as I told you, Galba. The emperor has no treasure equal to it. Show us where it's hidden, Lawrence. Do so, and perhaps we can arrange for you to escape just before your execution. I will show you the church's treasure. But you must allow me a little time to set everything in order. Make an inventory. I give you two days. That's all. You may go. I 
I told you, Galba. They're rich. Did you hear him? Valyrian's treasure can't equal theirs. It's strange that I've never been able to find a trace of it. That uh, it was very clever of you to uh, trick him with his own uh, doctrine. Thank you, Senator. Very clever, but I um, am a bit puzzled by it. Oh? Yes, that you should be so well-informed regarding Christian religion. Only one well-informed himself could make that observation, Senator. Uh, perhaps it's best we drop the subject. Good day, Galma. As Lawrence left the senator's house, he was exalted in the knowledge that Sixtus's prophecy might come true. Every ounce of gold and silver the church owned had been given away, and he knew that death would be sure when he returned empty-handed. And yet, he had told the senator and Galba the church had great treasure. He must show them this treasure. But how? His thoughts turned to the outcasts of the city. He quickly retraced his steps, crossed the Tiber Bridge, and made his way to a house in the heart of the slums. Gaius. Who is it? Lawrence. Come in quickly. I'm surprised to see you. I was told all priests and deacons had been arrested or were executed. I'm the only one left. I need your help. You need only ask. How many poor, blind, sick, lame are there in this section of the city? Oh, hundreds. Not afraid to identify themselves as Christians? Most of them would have been dead had it not been for the church. They'd risk their lives to show their gratitude. Then rally them. And day after tomorrow, march them into the street before Prefect Galba's house. That's all? Yes. At what time of day? When the sun is still three hours high. It shall be done as you wish. Hour after hour, Lawrence walked alone from one section of Rome to another, to the hospital the leper colony, the orphanages, to call on people to announce their faith in Christ. He shunned the homes of senators and people of quality, for Valerian's decree provided banishment and forfeiture of property for all those who confessed themselves Christian. And from experience, he knew how strongly men were attached to their property. At the appointed time on the second day, he was ushered into the room where Galba and the senator were eagerly awaiting him. Ah, come in, Lawrence. Yes, be seated. You've completed your inventory? Yes. How much is the treasure? It's incalculable. Oh, come. There's nothing that can't be measured. Uh, where is it hidden? In the hearts of men. Uh, Lawrence, I gave you two days to show us the treasure. Now stop speaking in riddles or I shall What's be... What's Oh, look below. The rabble of beggars. But the blind. Oh, the sick and the lame. I'll have the guards disperse them at once. Would you scatter the treasure I've so carefully gathered? What? What's that? What are you talking about? Don't turn away and hold your nose, Galba. Look upon them. The poor. The humble. The miserable. Yes, despised by man, but remembered by God's church. They've come to avow their faith. These are the treasures of the church I promised you. This is a trick that'll cost you your life. The axes and ensigns of Roman power are not for insult. No, no, listen to me. These are the riches of the church. These are the ones of whom Christ said, sell what you have and give unto them. Look well upon that crowd. For there lies your salvation. That which you do for the most miserable beggar, you do unto Christ. Take him away, Galba, and behead him at once. Mm. Oh, no, Senator. No, he would welcome that. See, see how his face lights up. He wants to die. That's your madness and your vanity, Lawrence. But we've ways of making death unattractive. It matters not how or when a man dies, but what he dies for. 
We'll see. The time will come when you cry out for us to put an end to your suffering. Then we'll give you back your words. No, Lawrence. You'll not die by one quick stroke, but by slow degrees. Here, you. What's your name? K.S. One of the treasures of the church who led that mob. I was present. I did not leave. Well, don't put those faggots on the fire. We want a bed of coals, not roaring flames. As you wish, my lord. Now give those others a hand to place that bed with the prisoner over the pit. Make sure he's securely tied. Have no fear. Well, Lawrence, the fire's waiting for you. No, Galpa. I am waiting for the fire. Put down the bed. Lawrence was placed on the gridiron, a few inches above the glowing coals. His faithful followers bowed their heads in prayer and asked God to be merciful in his hour of agony. His enemies waited with mocking smiles upon their lips, waiting for his cries of pain. But it was Lawrence who smiled, and it seemed as if he rested as one in ecstasy. To the Christians, it seemed that his face was surrounded by a beautiful light, and his suffering body gave off a sweet odor. But the unbelievers saw and sensed only what they were accustomed to, in the presence of torture. Galba, I can't stand much more of this. Why doesn't he give some sign of pain? I can't understand it. It's unnatural. But yet he lies there and destroys us with his silence. Destroys, Senator? What else? When we make this test of his God against ours and his spirit doesn't break, I'm coming to doubt the wisdom of these tortures. We've killed hundreds, but Christianity's stronger than ever. Should I stop this thing? No, no, no. We must not show weakness before the mob. Try to have Lawrence talk. Perhaps he will give some sign that the pain's greater than he pretends. Very well. Lawrence? Can you hear me? Yes, Prefect. Isn't it because you're akin to the devil that you don't feel his fire on your flesh? Rather, it is that my Christ is with me. And the fire of his passion is alive in my breast so intensely that your coals are a comfort and a refreshment. But didn't your Christ call out in pain when he was crucified? <laughs> in your vanity, you're setting yourself above him. Never that. Then, then why should one greater than yourself acknowledge pain and you deny it? Christ's tormentors spoke more truth than intended when they shouted, He can save others but not himself. His death was man's salvation. Oh, his words, words, words with you Christians. Words which twist back upon themselves and make contradiction seem profound. Can you Christians never speak words that ordinary man can understand? Yes. Yes, I can. Then do so. Let my body be turned. One side is broiled enough. Lay upon the multitude surrounding the glowing pit. As the hours went by, it intensified until people became conscious even of the sound of their breathing. The silence became oppressive and then terrifying as the persecutors waited for a single cry of agony from the roasting man on the coals. Galba and the senator looked into each other's eyes, quickly looked away, for each knew that stark terror gripped the heart of the other. From the far edge of the crowd, a woman sobbed, and the sound pierced the awful silence. Men stirred from cramped positions and softly prayed. Galva, I'm afraid. I know the feeling. I've never known a fear like this. Can we be wrong? And the Christians right about their Christ being the Son of God? Wait, wait. Lawrence is stirring. He is going to speak. Executioner. What? What do you want with the executioner? 
the body is cooked enough. Prepare for the feast. Stop it! Stop it! Stop torturing us, Lawrence. I beg you. I beg you in the name of your God. Give us some sign you're made of the same clay as the rest of us. Give us some hope that we've not destroyed one who's divine. I am nothing, Senator. Only a man about to be returned to the dust. Only a man like the rest of you. Except that I believe in the word. But my time has come. I pray for your conversion. For the conversion of Rome. And that from Rome the faith of Christ shall spread to all parts of the world. Tell me the truth, Lawrence. Are you divine? Lawrence, do you hear me? Answer, are you divine? He is dead. began to grant Lawrence's request for the conversion of Rome from the moment he made it. Several senators were so moved by the heroic fortitude and piety that they proclaimed their faith in Christianity on the spot. And as Caius moved forward to speak to Galba, they followed him. My lord. Yes? Well, what is it you want? May we have the body. What will you do with it? We beg you to permit us to give it honorable burial. Take his body. Do with it as you wish. Quick, help me lift him from the pit. See. See who lifts the body. Not, not the rabble. Four of the noblest men of Rome. The end has come for Roman gods. Shall I arrest them, Senator? Oh, what good would it do? We tortured a man to destroy his faith. We killed him, but made converts of those who came to mock and jeer. We are fighting words with fire and rack and swords. We cut out the tongue, but the word lives on in the minds and hearts of those who heard. Galba, the time of decision... Is here for us, too. Yes, I know. There, there stands the temple of Jupiter. There the procession with Lawrence's body. I, I have an overwhelming feeling. I must pray for help. Let us follow the procession. buried in a cemetery near the Via Tiburtina, and his death marked the decline of idolatry in Rome. For the living, St. Lawrence demonstrates the power of grace of Christ, which is able to sweeten whatever is bitter and harsh to flesh and blood.